So the first question I'll have to answer is, what does it mean to brominate an alcohol? And I guess the second one is, what is an alcohol? In very basic terms, an alcohol is any organic molecule that has an OH group connected to a carbon that has three substituents. The OH group is a pretty important functional group for a lot of different things in chemistry. But sometimes we want to alter the chemistry and do some different reactions, and to do this we need to swap this OH group for a different one. A very common thing to do is switch it for a halogen, and the most common ones that are used are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Once we've swapped this OH for a bromine, it opens up the molecule to something called substitution reactions. These halogens are referred to as good leaving groups and they're pretty easily replaced or substituted with different functional groups. There are two major types of substitution reactions, but we don't have to get into the details of those. Basically, just a carbon or an oxygen will come in and form a new bond and the bond between the bromine and the carbon will be broken. This allows us to pretty easily build up to bigger and more complex molecules. I am making the brominated version of one pentanol, also known as bromopentane, because I'm going to be using it in a future reaction. Also, I did make phosphorus tribromide in a previous reaction, so I really wanted to use it for something. In my previous phosphorus tribromide video, I actually mentioned that I would be making a chemical that attracts mosquitoes and other biting insects. This molecule doesn't really have a common name, and it's called 1-octan-3-ol, and this bromopentane is a precursor to that. The other precursor is something called acrolein, and I plan to make this in a future video, but for now I haven't made it. Anyway, that's enough talking, and it's a pretty long intro at this point, so we should get started with the chemistry. I first set up a little three-necked round-bottom flask with a thermometer on one end and a stopper on the other. I then pour in about 31 milliliters of dry pentanol, which has been cooled to about negative 10 degrees Celsius. To get the pentanol dry and cool, I simply poured it into a bottle containing molecular sieves, and I stored it in the freezer overnight. Once it's all been added, I attach an addition funnel to the center of the flask. I place the flask in an ice bath, and I start stirring it using a magnetic stirrer. To the addition funnel, I pour in 9.9 milliliters of phosphorus tribromide, which I made in a previous video. It should be noted that the phosphorus tribromide should be clear, but I got it a little contaminated, so it took on a yellow color. However, the amount of contamination is really low, and it really shouldn't affect any of the chemistry. You can see here, before anything happens, the temperature is around negative 10 degrees Celsius. When we're ready to start, we begin to slowly add the phosphorus tribromide in dropwise, only adding a few drops at a time. If you look at the thermometer on the left, you can see that by adding only a small amount, the temperature starts to increase quite a bit. This is okay, but during the entire addition, it's important to keep the temperature below 0 degrees Celsius. The reaction that's occurring here is one molecule of the phosphorus tribromide will react with three separate molecules of the alcohol. The final product of this is that the OH group of the alcohol is swapped with a bromine, and phosphorus acid is produced as a side product. The mechanism of this reaction isn't too complicated, so I'm actually going to cover it pretty quickly. The oxygen of the alcohol attacks the phosphorus of the phosphorus tribromide, and it attaches to it and kicks off one of the bromines. The bromine then comes back and attacks the carbon that was attached to the OH in the alcohol. The bond between the carbon and the oxygen breaks, and the oxygen goes with the phosphorus. This leaves us with an intermediate phosphorus molecule that still has two bromines attached to it. Because of this, the reaction can occur two more times, and the bromines that you see now around the phosphorus will be replaced with oxygens. The final molecule that that produces as a side product is the phosphorus acid. I took the flask out of the ice bath and dropped in some PBR3, and you can see it immediately sinks to the bottom. This is why we need good, efficient stirring so that we get a homogeneous mixture of the PBR3 in the pentanol. So the flask was then put back into the ice bath, and the addition was continued until all the PBR3 was done. After the addition, the reaction was allowed to stand and warm up to room temperature. 
it's very important to know at this point that the reaction mixture is saturated with hydrobromic acid. This reaction produces a lot of HBr gas and it's enough to pop off stoppers. You can see when I remove the addition funnel that a large cloud of HBr gas shoots out. The amount of HBr gas that it puts off will depend how wet the alcohol is. The phosphorus tribromide will react with any water present in the alcohol to produce hydrobromic acid and phosphorus acid. Anyway, I probably left it for 30 minutes or an hour for it to warm up. After the reaction, we have a pretty strongly acidic solution, so to clean this up, it's poured into about 50 milliliters of distilled water. It's kind of cool because before I shake the separatory funnel up, it actually formed three different layers. However, once I mix it around and shake it up, it more or less separates into two. It's kind of cool because instead of immediately separating, it kind of forms this lava lamp like stuff. It was kind of a pain and it didn't really want to all go together and I was stuck with this large blob that took a while to combine. Anyway, after a while it combined, and I added some saturated salt solution. The density of one bromopentane is higher than that of water, so it should be on the bottom, but you can see that the opaque layer of one bromopentane was on top before the salt solution was added. After the salt solution is added, things are cleared up a little, and the layers have been reversed. Our desired one bromopentane layer is now on bottom, and it's drained into a beaker. The upper water layer, which contains mostly salt and acid, is transferred to a beaker. It's kind of poorly displayed here, but when I test the pH using my universal pH paper, you might be able to see that the colors coincide with having a pH of about zero. Anyway, our crude one bromopentane product that we drained into the beaker is now poured back into the separatory funnel. It still contains quite a bit of acid, so on top of it, we pour in about 25 milliliters of saturated sodium bicarbonate solution. I added it in slowly and not all at once because I was a little bit afraid that it would froth over. Anyway, once it's all added, we take the separatory funnel off the stand and we shake it vigorously. It's very important to frequently open the stopcock like you see here to vent it because we are producing quite a bit of CO2 gas. After letting it stand for a while, you can see it separates into two white layers. The bottom whiter layer is our one bromopentane, and we drain this off again into a beaker. The opaqueness is due to the presence of water, but this is okay because we'll get rid of it in a later step. So just like before, the top aqueous layer is poured off, and our one bromopentane is re-added to the separatory funnel. On top of this, I added about 25 milliliters of water just to try to clean it up a little bit. Like the other steps, we cap, shake, and vent it, and then we place it back on the stand to separate. The bottom one bromopentane layer is again drained off, and we discard the top aqueous layer. And now for the final washing step, we pour the one bromopentane back into the separatory funnel. Now on top of this, we pour in 25 milliliters of saturated sodium chloride solution. The saturated sodium chloride solution likes to pull water, so when it's mixed with our one bromopentane, it should pull the water from it. So after capping, shaking, and venting, and letting it stand, you can see that the bromopentane is cleared up. So now instead of draining that bromopentane into the same beaker, we drain it into a clean flask. It's still a little bit cloudy due to water, so we add in some magnesium sulfate to try to get rid of it. So we shake it around, and then we let it sit with the magnesium sulfate for a little bit. The one bromopentane is then separated from the magnesium sulfate by filtering it through a pipette with a little bit of cotton at the bottom. This is filtered directly into a round bottom flask because I'm going to be distilling it in the next step. Once everything's filtered through, you can see it's no longer cloudy and it's a pretty nice clear liquid. However, the one bromopentane is still not pure, and we're going to have to distill it to clean it up. The solution starts to boil, and everything that I collected came over at around 128 to 130 degrees Celsius. This is extremely close to the theoretical boiling point of one bromopentane, which is about 130. So we collect our distillate, and you can see that it's still a little bit cloudy due to the presence of water. When the temperature starts to rise, we stop the distillation, and we're actually left with quite a bit of liquid in the distillation flask. 
You should ignore the stir bar going crazy, but you should notice the fuming that's happening. I'm not actually sure what remained in the flask, but its boiling point was, I think, greater than 200 C. When working with phosphorus-based compounds, there's always a fear of producing phosphine gas when doing a distillation. If there's any phosphorus acid present, if the temperature increases past 160 C, it can decompose to produce phosphine. So my recommendation is to stop the distillation immediately after the temperature rises above 130. Phosphine gas is extremely poisonous and it's not something to play around with. This is my final yield of slightly wet 1-bromopentane. The little bit of cloudiness that it has indicates that there's water present. In the distilling flask, I'm left with a slightly viscous, foul-smelling liquid. This is likely phosphite ester that forms between the phosphorus tribromide and the 1 pentanol. To the 1 bromopentane, I put in some molecular sieves that you can see at the bottom to pull out some of the water. After sitting for a while with the sieves with occasional shaking, you can see that the solution cleared up a lot. I pour it into a grad cylinder and the yield seems to be about 14 milliliters. The bromopentane was transferred to a bottle and molecular sieves were put on the bottom to make sure it stays dry. This final yield of about 14 milliliters represents a percent yield of about 39%. This yield is bad, but it's not horrible, and I think bromination reactions using phosphorus tribromide generally range from 40 to 70% yield. To make my desired molecule that attracts mosquitoes and the other biting insects, I only need a couple milliliters of this, so this is more than enough. Anyway, that's it for now, and I'll hopefully see you on the next one. Again, here's a list of the videos that I'm currently editing and future videos I plan to film. In the videos being edited category, you can vote for the one that you want me to publish next, and in the future video category, you can vote for the one that you want me to film next. Also, if you're feeling generous, please donate to my Patreon account because with a bigger budget per video, I can do more things. Also, just as some added information to this generic outro, I've actually gone ahead and made a YouTube fan page. When I get my act together, I should be able to set up polls there where people can vote on the next video. Anyway, that's all for now, and I'll see you on the next one.